Hello and welcome back to today's final splash of paint. Right, let's head straight off and join resident bookworm Henry Malt as it goes cover to cover with another top title available from the SIA Library to help develop your creative streak. Today's book review is actually more of a review on a series of books and this is the top tips. We've got Jeff Kurz's top tips, watercolours and, and Keith Fennick's top tips as well. This is quite a big series of books, is that right? Not huge. Yeah. Um, I think Search Press have commendably sat on their hands a bit with it mm. because it's something that absolutely stands or falls on its authors. If you just pluck somebody out of the ether, if they don't have a set of tips and if people don't think of them as somebody who has a set of tips, it's not going to work. Okay. Because as you can see, they are, it's quite a small format. Yeah. So the illustrations are quite small, okay. which ought to count against it, but it concentrates the pages. You, you can take in everything yeah. at a single glance. Okay. So does it work for you? Does it work as a format? Yes, I, I like the fact that it comes in bite-sized chunks. Yeah. That you only get, well in some cases, half a small page or at most mm. a spread on what we're doing. So, well, we've got a general heading there of designing your painting and then we go into composition, total yeah. balance, colour balance, all the standard stuff that you'd expect. Yeah. But very simply explained, there are occasional demonstrations throughout the series, but they're not... There's no sense that they are done to a format, oh, if this is page 43, we must be halfway through the third demonstration yeah. or whatever it is. Uh, although it, it is a rigid format and there are strong similarities, there are subtle differences between each book that suit the style of the particular author. So there, in fact, you've, it's completely different to what we were looking at before. Yeah. There he's showing the general picture and then we've got little details the pulled close out. Ups, yeah. For me, I've always been quite a fan of these little pocket-sized books in a way. I know it's not quite pocket-sized, but it's not far off because I've always told students that it's a good, if there's a really good book like this, it's a nice one. To, it's a good hardcover. It's kind of good to take with you when you're out painting, especially if you're out by yourself because it shows you how to do trees and things and how to paint the sky. And It's a nice way of learning, to be fair. And it, it shows you the little close-up segments as well. So, I mean, this one is about how to get a photograph into a painting. There's not a massive amount of words there, but it's it's tips that you want. Because one thing you don't want to do is sat there reading pages and pages. Well, the point know? of a tip is that it's visual. Mm. You look at it yeah. and you say, oh, yes, that's that's how it is. And you were talking about pocket size. Mm. Yes, and anything that's smaller than A4 is always described as pocket size. Yeah. And I assume that publishers just have large pockets. <laughs> you have to have a large pocket to put that in. And um, yeah. And you also said up, talked about taking books out. Do, do you take books out with you? Um, not now, but I mean, right. in the early days, I used but to have, did. I used to put like a little companion to watercolour painting kind of thing, which these maybe are. And it's, I don't know, I can imagine that'd be quite a nice thing to do. I don't think people who are established would do no. it, but maybe people who were learning and going on holiday and painting somewhere. How do I paint that tree? Oh, hang on a minute. I've got a book there by Keith, you know, who shows me how to do that particular style of tree. So that I've always wondered sky. whether people do actually take books out in, yeah, in the know. box. I mean, you're already lugging a stool and some kind of easel yeah. and a box of paints. Do you, in fact, take a library with you? It depends what medium you're doing, because watercolours yeah. doesn't really need much. All you want is your knee and a park bench and a couple of brushes and a bit of paint and a bit of water. So, in a way, these books are kind of maybe designed to do that because, I mean, they've got a really chunky hard cover They've got a good on. solid hard cover, and, and we should say they're spiral bound. Yeah. So that they will lay flat. flat. There you are, yeah. take your hands off. Yeah. And it's it got a nice kind of, almost like a sort of matte thick paper as well, which means if you do splash a bit of paint on it, it'll probably just mop off, I guess, as well. Yes. Possibly. Um, and in a moderate breeze, actually, those pages are not going to suddenly gonna, blow over exactly yeah. yes spiral bound is very nice actually because it sits nice and flat to the there table. are some books that should be spiral bound and there's some books that shouldn't be spiral yeah. bound yeah um and i have seen books that started life spiral bound yeah 
and then turned out as paperbacks. Yeah. And you just thought, you didn't understand the format, did you? Yeah. But actually, I'm quite impressed that Search Press have, have got it down and they seem to have got the production costs down mm. because it, it is an expensive way of doing it mm. and it can impact on the price. What do they actually, what is the price point on those? 9.99, which is what it should be. Yeah, that's quite a sensible price, isn't it, for that, really? But it would be very easy for the production cost to be pushed up, and it would be 12.99, and that's the wrong price point for a book like that. Yeah, I think the the top tips is always something that works for any medium, don't it? I think it's always good to have a book with tips in, because the, this artist, for example, Keith or Jeff, have many years of painting experience, and they've put it into this book. So it's quite nice. To, well, the, I mean, simple things just like adding texture to the side yeah. of an old barn. It's all it's all useful stuff, you know. Well, these are, they, these are both people who are established popular Absolutely, demonstrations. Yeah. Terry Harrison is in there. There's an Alwyn Crawshaw one. Yeah. Again, all people yeah. whose techniques you want to know, and there they are. And they've got a vast experience yeah. of painting what they've put into this book. So as a series, as a series of books, does it work? Well, I've always said you should just buy them as they come out. Yeah. Because I, I think that they do, you get a lot of variety doing it that mm. way. But yes, if you just wanted to buy your favourite artist. Yeah. No, if you're, going to, if you're going to do a book on a series on top tips, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Okay. No, Thanks good. again, Henry. Cracking review. Cheers, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Henry. These versatile, handy sized publications packed full of easy to follow, bite sized chunks of top tips and advice are definitely a must have for any artist reference library. Before we pack away our pencils, palettes and paint folks, let's have a quick dip into the splashy paint post bag and answer a few more of your artistic questions. First of all, Dan Alexander has emailed in to ask, what is the difference between pan pastels and a regular pastel stick? Is it a completely different medium? Really there is little difference except how they are packaged. You can use them alongside traditional pastels and other artist colours just fine. The only real difference is that these pastels is that they come packaged in the pan form, meaning they contain a lot more material than a regular pastel stick. And they are applied quite differently as well. They're generally applied using foam applicators. This painterly style means that they can be built up in layers and mixed to create different effects and marks. And finally, Pat Harmon has been in touch to ask, how can you mix a shadow colour? Well, I'll show you this one, actually. For me, shadows has been a massive part of my painting. Without shadows, a painting is nothing. And I've spent the past 20 odd years educating people that you need to use the right shadow colour. And lots of people use like a Payne's grey without realising it's too harsh, it's too black. A proper shadow colour should recede a little bit and give a bit of distance. So I've painted this little basic old rustic fence with some barbed wire on. I'm going to show you the right way to get the shadow colour. I use a size 6 brush for watercolours. You can use the same mix for any medium, really. A shadow colour should really contain primary colours, blue, red and yellow. So to mix this colour, you would use a blue like a French ultramarine or a cobalt or even a natural blue. And you can drop in to that blue just a little tiny bit of alizarin crimson, so that's the blue and the red. Now, I would say probably just 10% crimson. If you can work to that as a logic, that'll make sense. So blue, a little bit of crimson, and then the third colour in little dabs would be yellow ochre, which is the yellow of the primaries. And you add little bits of this and you'll eventually start to see a bit of a grey colour come through. Now you can make this darker or stronger or weaker, adding more water basically. And that's a good shadow colour. And that will always work, that shadow colour. You can see the nice grey there. And this is essential. If you look at the shadow of my hand on the uh, paper, you can see it's grey. And this colour is designed to replicate that shadow. If I add a few shadows to this, working across like a bit of a snow scene, if you like, I'll flick them across, obviously making them shorter as they go into the distance there. And I'll clean my brush just dab it on tissue and just basically take those ends away, fade them out as they go over. And you can see how that shadow works really well. You could also use the shadow colour as well to add, if it was to be a snow scene, you could add little mounds of snow that have kind of 
built up against the actual post. So they clean your brush on the tissue again and blend it away. Um, so 90% of a watercolour painting for me is shadow. And without them, it's nothing. So it's really important that you see how that makes a little drop on the other side. If that was paint's grey, it would be too heavy. If you don't want to mix the grey all the time because the problem is getting the, the consistency right, you can actually get the Matthew Palmer Natural Grey, which is this colour ready to go. So hopefully that answers your question for you. Remember, if you want any artistic advice, drop us a line here at the Splash of Paint studio. Simply email us at splashofpaint at saa.co.uk and we'll do our best to try and solve your artistic dilemmas. In the meantime, for more information, top tips or resources available to support you on your artistic journey, visit the SAA website at saa.co.uk. Well, that's all for today's packed programme, folks. I hope we've inspired you to try something new. Tune in next time when contemporary artist Marion Dutton works her charm with oils to paint a panoramic beach scene. Versatile landscape and wildlife artist David Hyde throws some light on how to soften and blend and add a touch of brilliance to the darker areas of your painting. And we'll introduce up and coming SAA artist Rachel McNaughton. Join us next time for another colourful edition of a splash of paint. Discover the colourful world of the SAA and bring a splash of paint into the comfort of your own home. Request a free copy of our Home Shop catalogue. Visit www.saa.co.uk for details.